If you have your Bibles, let me go to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And I'm going to be, begin reading at verse 1 through 9. I'm actually going to read out of the message translation today. Uh, it says this, Moses objected. This is right on God telling Moses he's going to go for help free his people. And so Moses objected. They won't trust me, Moses said. They won't listen to a word that I say for they're going to say God appeared to him hardly. So God said, what is, what is it that is in your hand? Moses said, a staff. God said, throw it on the ground. And so Moses threw it, and it became a snake. Moses jumped back really fast, and God said, said to Moses, now reach out and grab it by the tail. And he reached out and grabbed it, and he was holding his staff again. That is so they will trust that God appeared to you, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and also the God of Jacob. God then said, put your hand inside your shirt. And he slipped his hand under his shirt, and then he took it out, and his hand had turned leprous like snow. For he said, put your hand back under your shirt, and he did it, and then he took it back out as healthy as it was before. Here's what God says. So if they don't trust you and aren't convinced by the first sign, the second sign should do it. Father, we thank you for the Bible. God, we thank you that when we read it, it is nourishment for our soul. God, we do thank you for the Word of God. And God, it does not need any help from me. It can, it can preach all by itself. And so, Father, we simply read your Word today. We pray that you divide it as you see fit and place it into the lives of people uh, where they're living today. And may we walk out of this place changed today, transformed by the power of your Word. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. And everybody says amen and amen. If you're taking notes, I've tagged the title today. It's just a stick. It's just a stick. I believe God specializes in taking ordinary, everyday people just like me and just like you and, choose to do, and chooses to do supernatural things through us. I think sometimes the idea that, that we have when we come, come to church and, uh, is that we have nothing to offer the church. That you just have this idea that you want to come and just get and you want to come and you just want to take, but you never want to give back or let, let God use you. You think you're just, you're just supposed to come and always take from the church. That I, I, don't, I believe that couldn't be any further uh, from the truth. And so I think sometimes the enemy will come in and he'll, he'll convince you that you're winning by, by just sitting and resting and receiving when in reality you're not really winning until you're getting involved in serving and using the gift that God gave you. And I think sometimes we don't use the gift that God gave us because we, we think we're disqualified but, but because of using the gift that God gave us because of how we're currently living our life. Let me tell you, what you're walking through does not disqualify you. Like what, what, what thing you have in your life, it may, it may be different than, than my gift, it might be different than somebody else's gift, but your gift, the gift that God gave you is special, it's unique, and it's designed by God to be used by you for the glory of God. And so over and over in the Bible, like here's what I want to tell you, you don't refill your life by sitting and resting, you refill your life and your heart by serving. You don't come to church and say, I'm burnt out, I need to sit. Now nah, you need to get filled up with the Holy Spirit and serve. Like that, that's how you refill. That's how you get joy renewed. That's how you find and discover God's purpose. It's never by coming and just sitting and resting, but, it's, but you find it by getting involved in serving. Here's what I know. Our God uh, is, a, is a great recycling God that he, he takes and has, has this, this, this amazing gift that he takes what other people throw away and has a way of transforming it into being significantly, significantly used by him. He takes people that the world has thrown away. He takes marriages that the world has wrote off. He takes people that the world said can't be used. He takes people that the, that, that the world says can't be saved and that the world has looked over and the world has kicked to the curb and the world says ain't good enough. He has the tendency to use people that the world says cannot be used. He has a way of recycling them and restoring them and repurposing them into becoming something great, not for their life, but to be built by and built for the kingdom of God. He just has a way of turning people like me and maybe people like you that have been overlooked in the world, but God says I can use that. God says he can, he, he can use that. I know, I know you think you're disqualified because of something you've got. No, God says I can use that. 
Like, I know you think that dysfunction in your life is what's going to stop you from being used by God. No, God, no, God is saying, I, I can use that dysfunction. I can, I can use that negative. I, I, I can use that struggle. I can use that marital stress. I can use that to be, I, I can use the thing that you don't think that I want to, as a matter of fact, the very thing you do not think God wants to use is the very thing God does want to use. It's the thing that you want to cover up that God wants to uncover because if he can uncover it, his grace will cover it. If he can uncover it, I promise you, there's somebody else in the room going through the exact same thing you're trying to cover up. But had it not been for the grace of God, come on somebody, I know it's 830, I know it's actually 730, I know it's a little bit early, but I, do I got anybody in the room that's thankful that God chose to use you, that God chose to save you, that God chose to pour... That, that, Going, do I got anybody grateful that God could have used anybody? God could have saved anybody. God could have spoke to anybody. But do I got anybody at 830 today that's excited that God chose to use me? And I got to preach this two more times to help my brother out today. God said I can use him and I can use her. I think if we're honest, we've all doubted ourselves when it comes to the call of God in our life. If I can be completely vulnerable, I had many conversations about why I wasn't qualified to do what God has qualified and called me to do. I doubted my ability to lead people. I doubted my ability to, to, to preach and to teach and to pray and to build. I doubted, I doubted the very thing that God called me and created me to do. And I think if you're honest, you, you would say the same thing. I, I think that you would say that, that, that at some time or another, whether you've been called to preach or you've been called to, 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 to own a business or even in your workplace, like I think there's a, there's a, there's a moment where you doubt, you doubt the very thing God's called you to do. And I think we find Moses, Moses, if you look at the life of Moses, I, can, I, I relate a lot to Moses and I pray that I am not the Moses because no, Moses did not enter into the promised land. I pray that I'm a Joshua and I lead us into the promised land and into be, better things. And so personally, like this really resonates with me because I, I have a tendency to, 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 to put myself in the shoes of Moses and Moses, we find Moses hiding uh, in, in, from the call of God on his, on his life. In other words, Moses had, had the call on, his, uh, call on his life and he camouflaged himself on the backside of the desert for 40 years in the wilderness. I don't know if you remember the story, but how he ran away and even though God had raised him to be the deliverer, he still found himself running away from the very thing that God called him to be and to do. And so we find Moses camouflaging, hiding out in the wilderness, hiding from the very thing that God called him to do. And after 400 years of Egyptian bondage, God finds Moses in the desert and speaks to him in Exodus chapter 3. Come on, if, you, if you're a Bible uh, a school person or a Sunday school, you remember this, in a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And Moses comes in and the bush is burning and God says, I need you to go set my people free. So in other words, God, 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 God had to get the attention of Moses. And so can you picture this walking through, through your neighborhood and all of a sudden a bush is burning and there's a voice coming from the bush. God went to radical, radical extremes to get the attention of Moses. And I want you to catch this because if you read over it, you might miss it. He said, I want you to go set my people free. So in other words, other people's freedom were connected to Moses' obedience. Could it be today that other people are still living in bondage? Could it be other people are living outside of the will of God because their freedom is connected to your obedience to say yes to the call of God on your life? That no, you may not be able to save them, but you got a voice to invite them. And no, you may not be able to get their forgiveness, but you got a hand out to bring them to the house of God. Could it be somebody still trapped up in addiction because you're too busy to stop along your busy life and reach a hand down and say, God still cares for you, God still loves you? Could it be other people's freedom? Come on, it's connected to your obedience to Christ. I guess the question I want to ask you is who was still waiting because you haven't answered yes. And Moses tried for 40 years to camouflage the calling, to, to bury it and to hide from it and to run from it. And Mo Moses didn't have to get a GED. He didn't go to college, didn't go to seminary. But Moses was equipped with nothing but a stick and some shoes. 
And Moses standing there with a pair of sandals on his feet and a stick in his hand. And God said, I want you to take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Why would God say, Moses, take your shoes off? Because you're standing on holy ground. Because God knew that from the very beginning, Moses was a runner. And as long as he had shoes on, he could run from the call. and He could run from his presence. And so God said, Moses, I need you to go set my people free. But I need to, you to take your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground. In other words, God was saying, Moses, your running stops today. Your, your excuses stop today. Go ahead and take your shoes off. I've got a calling for your life. Come on, if we're honest, a lot of people are still running from the call of God in your life. A lot of fathers are running from the call of fatherhood that's on your life. A lot of men of God are running from the very thing that God has called you to because you don't think you're adequate, you don't think you're called, and you don't think you've got a purpose. Well, I come to tell you the devil is a liar, and you've got a God-given purpose, and you've got a God-given gift, and you, you, are, you are created for such a time as this. You are a mighty man of God. You're a mighty woman of God. Don't you dare run another moment from the very thing God has called you to do. Come on, it's time to quit, to, to, to quit running from it. It's time to quit making excuses about it. It's time to quit saying I'll do it next month. It's, it's time to quit saying that I'm not good enough or I don't got enough. No, God is good enough. And I remember when God called me to preach, I, I've never really met anybody that God called to preach that they weren't terrified. And let me just tell you, don't come to me and say, hey, I want to do what you do. You don't know what I do. You see the fruit of what I do. I ain't never, you met any preacher that, that is anointed by God and called by God. They never stand behind a pulpit and, and it's confident. I'm always nervous. I feel like I'm going to puke. Because this is more than just a lecture. This is more than just some TED talk. Like, no, I believe I visited with God this week and he gave me a revelation. And so I remember when, when God called me to preach and every week I thought it would get easier and I thought I would become more confident. I thought it would get a lot more smooth. But the deeper I go in God, the more stressful I am on Sunday morning and the more irritated I am on Saturday afternoon because I'm carrying a word that I'm trying to give birth to, not just because I need something to do for an hour and 30 minutes, every service on a Sunday morning but could it be that God gave me a word for your life today could it be God gave me a word for your family today could it be God gave me this rhema word for your such a time as this moment and maybe your calling's not preaching and maybe owning a business that may be working in, in, the, in the classroom and maybe on the construction site but let me help you when God has called you to do something there is a little bit of nervousness that goes with it you can do something in the natural and you can be confident about it, but when you begin to tag what you do in the natural with a supernatural gift, in other words, whatever you do on Monday through Friday is got to be more than what you do Monday through Friday. There's always something that you don't see that God has you in the place of what people do see. So you may be just a principal at Canal Elementary School, but you're not just the principal at Canala Elementary School. You're the pastor of Canala Elementary School, carrying the presence of God to every classroom. And although you may not preach the word, you speak the word. And although you may not lay hands on those kids, you pray for those kids. And what they know, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so as you walk up and down those schools, see, you don't just own a business. Nah, God is going to supernaturally bless you and provide for you so you can be a blessing for the people that work for you. You're not just a nurse at, on, on, on floor three at WVU Medicine, but you're a nurse on floor three at WVU Medicine. So you can not only give them what they need by prescription, but you can also give them what they need spiritually and supernaturally. Like God always has something on your life that, that other people don't see, but come on, that you're carrying inside of you. And so God so, shows up to Moses and Moses is saying, well, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not, I've ran my whole life. I, I'm not qualified. I'm not good enough. And God said, just shut up. Tell me what's in your hand. Moses said, I, all I've got is a stick. And God said, great, take that stick and throw it on the ground. And when he threw it on the ground, your Bible says it turned into a snake. So in other words, what was natural became supernatural when it left your hand and went into his presence. 
My question today is this, what, what's in your hand that you've not let go of that God's telling you today to throw it down? And not only did he tell him to throw it down, but then once he threw it down, now, now, now this is the next thing that, 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 that I, I don't know why God would say it. But he said, I want you to pick it up by the tail. Now, I'm no, I'm no snake expert. As a matter of fact, I hate snakes. I'm terrified. Even the little green guard, gardener snakes, my knees go weak. But I know one thing. I ain't never picking a snake up by the tail. Where do you pick it up at? The head, right? You get a stick and you, you cut its tail off right behind its head in Jesus' name. But if you want to pick it up, you, you grab it by the tail because you, you by the head because the tail can't bite you, but the head can. And so, Mo, so when God said, Moses, I need you to, I need you to grab hold of that, that, that snake by the tail, like, in other words, like, I need you to trust me that what, what I'm going to call you to do is not going to bite you, it's not going to wound you, it's not going to hurt you. Now, I'm one of these people that believe snakes, even today, you can call me crazy, but I believe snakes are symbolism for the enemy attacking in your life. As a matter of fact, in our family, anytime we see a snake around our house or my wife sees a snake in weird places, it's, it, and it's rang true, call us what you, what you want, but when we see the, the, a snake here and a snake there, we, 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 we are ready and we brace ourselves for an attack or a battle that we're, we're about ready to walk into. And that's been proven over the last four years when we see it. My, my wife says, hey, I had a dream about three snakes. I said, oh, God, here we go again. Who's going to leave us now? And so I just know that, that sometimes we, we, we have a tendency to think, nah, snakes are good. No, no, all snakes are bad. Like your pet snake is demon-possessed. Get rid of it. <laughs> if you own a snake, you're probably devil-filled. I'm not joking. <laughs> and my sister had a pet snake for years, and I knew she was demon-possessed. That's just why I know. You know, that snake got loose in her house one time. They didn't see it for six months. And they walked into the bathroom, and they had the towel on the, on the bathroom floor was kind of raised up, and that snake was coiled up. That's how the enemy is loose in your life. You don't even know it's loose, but it's crawling up all over your, and all of a sudden you'll walk in to do, and it'll be right there. That's just, that's good preaching if I do say, say, say so myself. So what am I trying to say? Sometimes God will make you overcome your fear by picking up what you gave to him, thinking you weren't qualified enough to pick it back up. God said, I want you to pick it back up by the tail. And so when, when Moses took it up back, back up by the tail, the, the, what was once fearful now become a stick or his rod again in his hand. And I, th see, I think there's something so powerful in this story that I, I want you to get up that, and I want you to pick up that the stick was so common, the stick that was so ordinary, that stick that was so average when, when he relinquished it, when he gave it, when he threw it. In other words, when he took his fingerprints off of it, and, we and he took what he had, kind of like the five loaves and the two fish. When, when, when they gave the five loaves and the two fish to Jesus, what was little in their hand became much in his. And so just like the five loaves and two fish, when Moses gave him what was in his hand and he took his hands off of it, God did something supernatural with it. And the point I guess I'm trying to make on this crazy sermon today is sometimes we think we have to be extraordinary to be used by God. And that could not be the furthest thing from the truth. God wants to take your ordinary and put his extra on it. And when God put his extra on your ordinary, all of a sudden you do extraordinary things. Not for your benefit, come on, but for God's benefit. You don't got to be super talented. You don't got to be super good looking, super brilliant, super amazing. What God is looking for is something simple, ordinary, average, and common. Because sometimes all God needs is a stick. Exodus 14, we're standing at the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his army are coming after and Moses and the Israelites. God says, take that stick and hold it up. And with that stick held high above his head... Come on, God parts the Red Sea. Why? Because sometimes all God needs is a stick. 
Exodus 15, when they were at the bitter waters of Marah and the people are thirsting to death. And after being in the wilderness, God said to Moses, hey, take that tree branch and get a stick off of it and dip it into the bitter water. And that bitter water will become sweet again to drink. Why? Because sometimes all God needs is just a stick. And when the widow's woman was about to die and she was going to prepare her last meal for herself and for her son and the prophet showed up, what did he find her doing? She was gathering sticks to give herself one more one one more thing for her life. And, and, and the prophet said that, that he's going to give you the formula for the miracle in her life. Why? Because sometimes all God needs is just a stick. In 2 Kings 6, when they were building the school of the prophets and one of the men that was swinging the only axe, I don't know if you ever heard about the axe head floating, but that axe head flew off and went into the Jordan River and God said to the prophet, hey, take a stick and touch the river. And when he touched the river with the stick, the Bible said that the axe head floated and it didn't say it just floated, but I think it swam itself with a backstroke down the river. Why? Because sometimes all God needs is a common, ordinary stick. And in Exodus 17, Moses is told by God to strike the rock. And when he did, when he struck it, the rock with a stick, guess what? What Water flowed and millions of people drank and their thirst was quenched. Why? Because sometimes all God needs is just a stick. And when God was ready to redeem the world and he's going to let his son die, what did he choose to do? He chose to let him die on two sticks. All because God said, I just need a couple pieces of wood. I I need a couple pieces of, of, of wood to be able to make. I just need a couple sticks. Why? Because I know the stick can hold the Son of God because sometimes all God needs is just a stick. I wonder what excuse you're making today because what you have doesn't seem significant, doesn't stream, it doesn't seem extraordinary, but in God's eyes, all He needs is that stick in your hand. And if you just let the stick out your hand and get it in the presence of God... I know it's early, but I'm preaching better than you're shouting me down. I can promise you that. And so why don't we just make the commitment today to stop talking about what we don't have, what we can't do. Why don't we just quit talking about how we're inadequate and how we're not smart enough and we're not going to be able to do it and We're not going to be able to raise enough money to build this building. We're not going to be able to have enough resources to buy this property. Why don't we quit talking about all the stuff that we don't think we can do? And why don't we start talking about the things that we we know our God can do? Come on, why don't don't we just start talking about all the negativity? Why don't we just stop talking about how how we don't measure up and how, how we're not gifted enough? I know we're not good enough. I know we don't got enough, but I serve a God who is God enough. And I serve a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hill. I have a God that can part the water when the water's running full. I serve a God, come on, who can do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. So God said, are you closing me down already? Praise God. <laughs> God, God said, what's in your hand? Moses said, I, 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 I have a stick and throw it down, pick it up and put your hand in, 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 your, in your shirt, pulled it out. It was leprous like snow, put it back in the shirt. Like Mo, God was equipping Moses to do the thing that he called him. If you go back to Exodus chapter 3, when he said, you're going to go to Pharaoh and you're going to, you're going to be the one that's going to be my deliverer. You're going, to, you're going to free the people out of the hand of Pharaoh. In other words, he was giving him a prescription to do what he's... God will never call you to do something that he doesn't give you something in your, in your life to fulfill. When David slew the giant, he didn't send David to conquer the giant before David had the equipment he needed to slay the giant. Like anything God called you to do, he will equip you to do it well. And so I came with a question today for you is, if God chooses to do it, would you be ready for it? Like if God decides to fix your marriage, are you ready for it? If God decided to save your kids today, would you be ready to commit to bringing your kids to church for the next seven or eight weeks straight to make sure they have a great rooted foundation in God's word and house of God? Like if God decides to elevate you, to give you influence, would, are you ready for it? If God decides to give you a breakthrough, are you ready for it? If God decides, you to, to, he decides to bless you, 
are you ready for it? If God decides to call you out, are, are, are you ready for it? If God decides to make a way where there was no way, are you ready for it? And I think we all would say, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I can tell you're all excited. You're all ready for it. But if we were excited today, we would say, yeah, I'm ready for it, preacher. And that was all a trap, a trap and a trick question because, yeah, it's not that does, does God want to do it? No, God wants to help you. God wants to change you. God wants to heal you. God wants to use you. God wants to promote you. God wants to open up doors for you. But the question is, are, are you ready for it? Moses had to be ready. Moses like, God, I can't do it. I'm a stutterer. I, I can't speak in front of people. Like, you got the wrong person. You should have you you, you, you picked somebody else. And Moses like, hey, go, go get Aaron. Aaron will be, Aaron's going to be your spokesperson. He's, he can speak. He's affluent. Like, go get Aaron. He, Aaron's going to help you. He's going to be your vocal box for you. He's going to be your right-hand man. He'll do what you don't think you can do. And, the, and by the power of both of you, you'll accomplish what I called you to accomplish. Let's fast forward to Exodus chapter 7. A lot has transpired, and Moses works up the courage to, to go in and to meet Pharaoh face to face. And I don't know if you've ever taken a test when you were in school that, that you weren't prepared for. And then I want you to compare it to taking a test that you were prepared for. So I feel like Moses was prepared for the test that was laid out before him because he knew. He knew he knew he had the he knew he had the weapon of when he threw the the, the, the staff down it would turn into a snake. He knew he knew he had the weapon if he put his hand into inside of his shirt and pulled it out, it would be leprous, and if he dunked it again and pulled it back out, it would be healed. Like he knew he was prepared for the test he was about ready to take. So I think Moses, when he walked into the presence of Pharaoh, he had a little bit of swagger in his step. Like, I know, I, I know my God's got this. I, I know, I know my God's faithful. I know God's given me everything I need. To not only meet this moment, but exceed in this moment. In Exodus chapter 7, it wasn't Moses that threw the rod down. It, it, was, it, it was Aaron. The Bible says when Aaron threw the rod down, it became a snake. And, and he picked it back up again, it became, it, it became a rod again. And the Bible says Pharaoh called some magicians. It's in your Bible, Exodus chapter 7. He called some magicians. And he, and, he, and he brings the magicians in and he told the magicians what Aaron just did and the magicians threw their rod down and it became a snake. And he picked it back up and it became a rod again and they threw it back down and it became a snake and Aaron threw his rod down and it became a snake. And here's the thing I want to tell you. If you read your Bible in Exodus chapter 7, it says that Aaron's shaft or Aaron's rod or Aaron's stick consumed all of the, the magician's sticks. So in other words, a magician may be able to do magic, but a magician cannot do a miracle. They can do trickery. They can do sleight of hand. What are you trying to say? There's always going to be something else that is fighting for the very thing that God gave you to use for the glory of God. And I just want to pause as I try to wrap this message up as fast as I can. I want to tell you, in today's world, there's a lot of false doctrine being taught. There's a lot of false gods being taught. There's a lot of false theologies being spoke of. There's other religions being preached. There's, there's other ways of, of sexuality being preached and other forms of marriage being preached and other forms of what it looks like to be a Christian being preached. And you got Buddha and you got Muhammad and there's New Age and there's everybody makes it to heaven and Jesus understands my sin and Jesus made me this way. I was born this way and Jesus understands. Let me say that the devil is a liar. That there's only one Lord. There's only, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to live your life. There's only, there, there, there's, there's only one way to surrender your heart. It's not to make excuses as to why you're living in sin. No, what, what, what's the Bible saying? That, there's, that, that God's truth will swallow all up the other false truths. Like God's truth will remain. God's truth will stand. Moses, he... He does this amazing thing in front of thousands of people. Aaron did this thing in front of Pharaoh and all of his magicians. And here's where, I, here's where I, I'm right exactly where I want to be in this message. That God can take something simple, common, ordinary, and place his anointing upon it. And he can transform it into something brilliant and sensational. The greatest part of this miracle is, that, is not that God used Moses and his stick. 
But the greatest part of the miracle is that even after God showed Moses the miracle, God still needed to, Moses still needed to rely on God. Your gift will never outgrow your ability to rely on God. Your gift can never take you to a place that you don't need the hand of God to touch your life. You cannot allow your gift to supersede your God. The greatest part of the miracle is that Moses was able to do miracles, but he still needed to rely on his God. Ten plagues later, a few, a few tough moments. Moses led the children of Israel out of the bondage in the hand of Pharaoh. And I guess what I want to want to get to today is some of you, like you need, you need to be able to throw that thing down to the feet of Jesus. You need to say, all right, God, I'm going to give you everything I am. I need to give you everything I'm not. I know I thought I was disqualified and I wasn't good enough, but I've come to tell you there is an anointing on your life. There is greatness in your life. There is a God-given purpose in you. There's a call on your life. There's a fire in your heart, and it might be low, and it might be flickering, and it might even seem that the fire has begun to go out, but if you'll just begin to stir the ashes and let the wind of the Holy Spirit blow in your life again that fire will come alive and that fire will burn bright and your faith will be reborn and if you can get that fire lit in your heart I'm telling you ain't no demon in hell that can stop your purpose and I know it might just be a stick to you but it's a mighty weapon to be used by God and it'll part waters and it'll it'll do miracles oh I know you think it's just a smile come on but that smile has a way to speak a thousand words come on it might just be a stick to you but it's not a stick to my God come on I want to declare something today that people are coming back to the house of God that people are returning to the house of God and churches all across our world are filling up again and people are returning to God again and families are returning to God again and I know it don't seem like much but my Bible says little is much when God is in it Come on, it's time to stir up that gift. It's time to throw down that stick. Say, here, God, I'm no longer going to come and sit and think I'm winning. I'm no longer going to come and rest and think I'm winning. But I want to give you my gift. I want to give you my resource. I want to give you my influence. I want to I want to give you my future. I want to give you my family. And I know my family's dysfunctional. I know it, it's got a little bit of crustiness on it. But I want to throw that down at your feet. Because when you throw that stick down at his feet, what it was natural to you become supernatural to him come on God's created you on purpose for a purpose it's so much more than just a stick come on it's so much more than just some gift God's given you come on it's a key that unlocks a door it's a sermon you don't even got to preach with your word but you can preach with your life come on God's given you something to be used for the glory of God come on it's more than just a stick